Hey everyone, today we're going to be doing another video in my Is It Normal series. The last one we did was on Glocks. I had my friend the Hasio SMC here pop in a little bit for that, but I want him to be a little bit more of an active participant in this video, which is going to be about AR-15s. Now, as you guys know, I've done a lot of shooting with AR-15s over the last several years. Um, however, while you have also done a lot of training and shooting, you also now work at a gun shop. So you get a lot of these yeah. questions from people asking, mm -hmm. is it normal? So one of the first things I wanted to cover is one of the first things that I see new shooters talk about. After they're done with their shooting and they still have rounds in the magazine, they'll pop the magazine out, rack the round out, and they'll look at the round, and lo and behold, there's a little uh, strike on the primer. And people say, uh oh, is this normal? Like, is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? Should I be aware of this? Um, so, first of all, is that normal? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, to address exactly why that's happening, are you pulling the BCG out? Yeah, I got you. So, typically when it comes to firearms, you'll typically have either a floating fire pin, firing pin or a spring-held firing pin. On the AR-15, it is a floating firing pin. So what that means is there's nothing that is propelling that to the rear. It's just floating around in there. Now, under normal operation, it's not enough to actually ignite around. You have to have the hammer strike it to ignite the round but that firing pin is floating around in there. So as your bolt goes home, i.e. goes forward and chambers the round, that firing pin under inertia will also go forward as well and then be stopped by the primer of your case. So it'll make a little tiny indentation in your primer. Now, that little tiny indentation is not enough to set off that round. Correct. Yeah, that's right. So uh, I dropped the firing pin, so I'm gonna grab it. <laughs> Uh, your firing pin, like he was saying, it rides in this channel here inside your bolt and there's nothing to keep it back. There's no spring tension to keep that back is what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. So as, as it's, you're moving the gun forward and backward, it has the capability of falling forward and coming back. And especially if you slam, slam the firearm on something heavy, um, it, can, it can have the, the firing pin ride forward. Um, fairly hard and leave a small dent in the back of the case, the primer. Now, the thing about primers, a boxer primer, which is in the vast majority of 5.56 and 223 ammo, is that it's a, it's a pretty hard primer. Uh, military primers are actually even harder, mm. they have, meaning they have a thicker piece of brass on the back, so that just to avoid this exact thing, which is which is uh, uh, what they call a slam fire, mm -hmm. where like if you made if you made the the, the gun move at a very quick quick pace and then stop very quickly, like if it was dropped and it, it went very quickly and then hit the ground, that the firing pin could bounce and, and set off the round. Um, the likelihood of that happening is so extremely small, it's, it's Almost not negligible. Almost talking about, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, to put it simply, you're not gonna find yourself in a situation where that's gonna happen, essentially or at least 99.98% of the people watching this are never gonna ever be in a situation like that. Yep, definitely. Um, now there are firearms that do have a spring tensioned firing pin. A lot of like the HK roller delay blowback stuff, they have spring tension or some some method of preventing that. Um, you have uh, like, you know, the Century C308. Some AKs, it's like some AKs have springs, some don't, some are floating around. So all that to say, if you rack around out of the chamber that's unfired, and you see a little tiny indentation in the primer. That totally is normal. absolutely no, absolutely normal. Yep. Nothing to be concerned about. I would be worried if there wasn't one. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, you have more to worry about if there's not. For one. real. I mean, I, I've I've bought brand new bulk carrier groups and had the firing pin be broken. Really? It happens. Yeah. Well, well mechanical well, things fail. Here. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the next thing I wanted to talk about is probably very very few people wondering about it, but I have had people ask about it, and that is when people are shooting. Just bump the mic, so I apologize. When people are shooting, they'll hear this kind of twangy noise. Like it sounds like there's a broken spring or something is going on back here that doesn't sound intuitive. Let's say. Um, so is that normal? Yeah. Yes. Yep. Totally normal. Yeah. Uh, it's a giant spring, mm -hmm. and it's rubbing on. Oh, we have this one. Apart. <laughs> it's rubbing on the interior of your. Uh, you want to hold it up there so the folks can see it. Yeah. Uh -huh. Just try to pull. Oh, no, no, no. Just hold it, hold it. Oh. Yeah. Wow. Okay, so so this, this tube right here is called the receiver extension, mm -hmm. uh, commonly referred to as the buffer tube. Uh, either is really right. But uh, 
in the mil spec inside the, the, the coating on the inside of a mil spec tube, not the mil spec size, but an actual mil spec receiver, uh, receiver extension, the coating that is in there is specifically made to lubricate and, and quiet the, the spring as it moves up and down inside there uh, while you're firing. So um, when people come in and say, you know, why am I getting that twang? You know, this isn't really twanging, but you can kind of hear it scraping. Um, most, more likely than not, it's because you don't have a mil spec tube. Um, that's probably what's going on with it. I've never heard it before and been like, oh, oh no, uh, I hear a twang. I'm, I'm usually focusing on the target, mm -hmm. my front sight and shooting the target. And any sort of twanging or anything, I don't even notice. Yeah. So. Yeah, so again, totally normal. There are companies that make silent springs out there. Like I think Geisley's is supposed to be pretty quiet. Um, and there's, there's other companies that do that as well. So if that is an issue to you, quote unquote an issue, um, there are ways to make it quieter, but it, it's it's really a non-issue. Yeah, and I, I absolutely would never use anything new in the gun without testing it a fair amount first. Sure. Uh, because all AR-15s, even though they seem like they all fit together and, and they just work, they just work. That's not true. So any anytime you add something to the gun, you want to go out and, and test it a fair amount just to make sure that that item that you just put in there is going to work. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Especially and especially if it's a home defense type scenario, anything that you have for personal protection, whether it be a carry gun or your home defense gun, make sure you function test it as configured. Um, before and that's even to make sure the ammo that you're using for defense runs through it um, yeah so the next thing I wanted to talk about um, is something that is more commonly talked about in 300 blackouts um, which is, is gonna fall under this video and that is when you see the neck of the case and I don't have an example here with me I tried to look at home to see if I had um, 300 blackout brass that had this little line but I've resized all of it, so unfortunately it's all rounded back out. But occasionally you'll see that there is a line in the neck of the case. So obviously when you fire the round, the projectile itself here leaves the barrel, hopefully. And then with this type of ammo, maybe not all the time. Um, and the, there may or may not be a, like a linear dent in the neck of the case. And again, as with everything else we've talked about so far, that is absolutely normal. So AR-15s were designed around a 223 cartridge, which is, a, while the same diameter case, a significantly longer case. 300 blackouts, basically a cut down, necked up 556 case. So because the geometry was built around a longer case, as the round is being ejected, because there's a shorter amount of case, it starts coming out of the chamber earlier in that recoil process. So it takes a sharper turnout and then it'll rub up against the shell deflector right here. So it'll actually impact the shell deflector and put a little line in the neck of the case. Again, 100% normal. And if you are a reloader with 300 blackout, when you do your resizing die, resizing and decapping die, it'll round it right back out. I've done it to I don't know how many cases and it's been a non-issue at all. Right, it's also it's also a big issue with uh, sometimes with um, five five six, mm. depending on the cartridge um, and, and the loading. Um, actually, farther back down on the neck of the casing, it can mm. often get a dent in it, which is not uncommon at all. Right, very normal. And kind of using this as a segue into the very next issue that I see some people wondering about, talking about that shell deflector, is sometimes people will see these like brass colored lines mm. showing up in their shell deflector, and they'll think oh, what's going on here, is this normal? Um, and just as what would cause that line or the linear dent in a case, same thing's happening. So your brass cases are hitting the shell deflector and sometimes it just leaves a little bit of material. Yeah. Um, You're talking about a high velocity piece of brass hitting steel, uh, aluminum mm -hmm. uh, and it's hitting it very closely. So it's still, uh, it's just leaving a little bit of transfer as if two scar two cards just kind of kiss each other. Right. But sometimes they'll leave a little bit of paint transfer. Same thing here. Yep, exactly. So again, there are, if, if it bothers you, there are cleaning supplies out there that'll take the brass lines off. But again, 100% normal, to be expected, um, not an issue whatsoever. Um, are there any things, or are there things that you've experienced working at a gun shop of people coming in saying, is this normal? that 
you've run into quite frequently that you could bring up? Um, most of the problems that, that people run into with the AR-15 tend to, to happen with the gas system, and it's usually on, on guns that they've built themselves or on guns that they've decided to modify in some way. Um, and like I was saying before, the AR-15 seems simple, like you can just slap them together and they'll work, they'll work but that's not really the case. Um, each each uh, gas system is designed to work uh, with the, the length of the gas and your dwell time and the weight of the buffer and the buffer spring and all of that. So basically, to, to break it down Barney style, the easiest way that I can, de can describe this is to describe the function. So you have your cartridge, or excuse me, you have your bullet traveling down the barrel. It's traveling down the barrel here. It's being pushed. It's being pushed. Your bolt is all locked up uh, back here. It's nothing. Nothing's changing. And then the you can't really see the gas block here, but gas block is right about here. Once that bullet passes the gas block, the dwell time is the time that it takes for the bullet to go from past the gas hole, the, the, the gas port, to the time that it leaves the barrel. So in this case, it's going to be about five and a half, six inches. However long it takes the bullet to travel that five and a half, six inches, ladies, is <laughs> is how how long how much gas is being fed up through the gas port through the gas block down the tube and being pressed against the gas key, which is on top of the bolt carrier group, and then being pushed backwards. So if you have a lot of gas coming down through there and it's pushing back on the gas key very very hard, it can slam backwards making it feel like you're having more recoil. The way to fix that is to either make the gas port smaller by putting an adjustable gas block on it or to increase the weight of the buffer to make so that it's slowing that mass down and then returning it faster. But when you start changing things from factory specifications or you're building a gun from scratch and you're not quite sure, then sometimes you may experience malfunctions with that, um, that system. So most, most questions that I get revolve around um, worn out springs, buffer springs, um, buffer weights, um, and then you have um, gas, gas block systems, like adjustable gas blocks, and gas length systems, how long the gas is, and then also barrel length. And so all of those things play into the gas system, and it's really too much to kind of address in a video like this, yeah. but that kind of gives you a better picture of like, the gas system as a whole and how it functions and that it's kind of delicate and sometimes you have to just play with it like okay i'm going to put a lighter buffer in and see what happens yeah yeah and honestly that's where because him and i both took an armorer's course and that's where i really got my full appreciation of how delicate the system is if you start throwing things off with the gas system especially um just there's so many variables to, to be aware of to figure mm -hmm. out what's going on are overgassed, undergassed, and what the correct solutions are based on the situation you're in. The other one that I get that's probably a, um, a beginner's one, but is, is actually kind of a big one, surprisingly, um, for those of us that have been dealing with AR-15s for quite some time. Um, the question that I get a lot is, how do I put the bolt carrier group back in? Mm, yeah. <laughs> um, I had this with my brother. We had a, he had to FaceTime me because he yeah. couldn't get his BCG back in. So it's hard to see. <laughs> it's hard to see inside here, but there's actually in this channel in the bottom, or I guess you would say in the top, there's two little holes for the ears on your your charging handle to go into. And so what I see is a lot of people try to put in the charging handle from the rear, or they put it in too far, and then they try to feed in the bulk hair group. That's not going to work. So I came up with a pretty simple way to do this and explain it. Basically, what you're going to do is you make sure this is oriented in the correct direction, which is up. I'm gonna turn my, my uh, upper receiver upside down. I'm gonna insert this into the big hole as far as I can, press down, then I'm gonna pull it backwards slowly until it falls into those, those little ears. Then I'm gonna push it forward slightly so that it holds it together. Then you can let go. Once you're done with that, you make sure your bolt is in the forward position here. Make sure it's fully assembled and that you have your <laughs> retaining, pin. retaining pin in the correct place. And then you're going to feed the gas key, which is this piece here, into that channel and then push all of that to the front and then make it click into place. And then I close the dust cover because the dust cover actually keeps it from falling out the back as well. 
and that's the easiest way to, to put together. And then, yeah, it's so that's easy. Yeah, <laughs> it's a minor thing, but again, it, when you're new, we have to remember what we didn't know when we were starting out. So that's one of the big ones. Like, because like I said, literally earlier this week, I had to explain to my brother over FaceTime. Yeah, he was even trying to put the BC in, BCG in backwards. But anyway, um, so yeah, absolutely. Is there anything that people have come to you about? Is this normal? Where it hasn't been normal? Where it's actually been an issue? Um, mostly that's from most of the things that I see that are not normal are, are, are usually very, very rarely is it, um, the customer. Usually it's the manufacturer and wh when you're going to run into this stuff is substandard manufacturers. Um, maybe sometimes small manufacturers, not always small manufacturers, but sometimes they're going to use parts and pieces they shouldn't be using or, or install them incorrectly. And then you go out to shoot it and it doesn't work. Um, that actually happens really often. Yeah. Um, there's there's uh, places around, I, I won't mention their names, that we are constantly fixing their, their, their mistakes. And we're happy to do it. It's, it's kind of almost an adventure. We do catalog mm -hmm. all of the, the things that, that are built incorrectly. Um, so that, that's always kind of an adventure. It's kind right. of fun. Um, well, cool. So again, I just wanted to cover some of the main things. Obviously, there's going to be things we probably left out in this video. So if you have other things that you think are worth mentioning in a video like this of is it normal, um, definitely throw those down in the comment section. Uh, we've done Glocks. We've done ARs now. We can do AKs or pretty much any of those other major groups. Um, so definitely leave those suggestions down below. Um, currently, we are shooting this up at TJ Gun Sales in McMinnville, Oregon, where the Hasio SMC works. So can you put in a little plug for TJ Gun Sales? Yeah, stop in at TJ Gun Sales. We're always happy to see you. Um, happy to help out with anything. Um, in fact, we help people do builds, AR builds all the time. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, uh, I, I've bought several rifles here. I bought one today. Um, I'm actually now consigning one. So yes. um, stop in if you want to see that. Um, really, really good selection here. Good people and uh, definitely worth a look if you are in Oregon or close on the I-5 corridor. Um, anything else you want to add? Uh, shoot safe. Absolutely. So anyway, with all that said, uh, you can check me out on Full 30 now, as well as the Haas USMC here. Um, if you feel so inclined, I do have a Patreon page where you guys can go. I upload all my content there early, as well as doing some exclusive content. So check that out if you feel so inclined. You should. You should. But with all that said, as always, I hope you got something out of this video, and I really appreciate you watching.